Hey, good morning, everyone. Voice Pastor Q. Thank all you guys for joining me again for our 11 a.m. service here at Word Movers. I thank God for all you guys that uh, joined us for our 9 a.m. service. I definitely believe that we had a great message this morning. Thank God for uh, just continuing to uh, reveal in us his spirit and his truth of his word. So I thank all you guys in fellowship with us at 9 this morning. And I thank you guys is here with 11. We're all bedside Baptists at this point. Just thank God for all the uh, other ministries that are continuing to go live and um, not allow this to be a time where uh, his people is not being fed. So I truly thank God for that. Thank God for just blessing us. We have a word this morning. If you was with us this morning, we thank you. If you haven't turned to me to the book of John chapter 11, we know this is uh, Resurrection Sunday as we believe and was taught we're to celebrate the uh, resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I mean, he died um, on the Friday, they believe, and rose again on a Sunday, three days later. So thank God for his resurrection. Thank God for all you guys. Let's check it out again. Thank God for the message. If you want to turn with me to the book of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and we will be in the uh, somewhere around the 17th, 18th verse, I believe we started this morning. Um, matter of fact, you can actually go to 20 if you want to. John chapter 11, verse 20. We're going to pray. We're going to open up a word of prayer. Allow God to be able to bless us this morning with his word. Good morning to all you guys out there that's watching. Praise God. At this time, we normally be in our T Street location, so we just thank God for being with us this morning, allowing us to have some type of service today to get the word this morning. Amen. Father, we just thank you right now. We thank you for your word. As you, we believe that you can do it again as you did it this morning, Father God. Praying for pe your people right now, Father God, that they may be able to receive the unadulterated word of God. Thank you this morning for all you do, all you're going to do. Thank you for keeping us and keeping us in a perfect peace, oh, Father God. Allow your word to be uh, displayed this morning, demonstrated, oh, Father God. In Jesus' name we pray and we thank you, Lord. Amen. So, yesterday I had the opportunity to uh, do a radio interview for uh, Brother John E. Ross, and uh, the, our topic of discussion was tradition. And uh, we, 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 we talked about tra tradition versus the now. And um, through, through all praying all week long, God has been dealing with me about tradition because every Resurrection Sunday or those who celebrate Easter versus Resurrection Sunday, God was just showing me inside of my spirit that a lot of people were falling into traditions. A lot of the churches want to be open because so they can do traditions. But God said he want his people to worship him in spirit and in truth. God said he doesn't want us to be in tradition, but he want us to be able to have a relationship. So I begin to, I posted something this week on Facebook, said as the resurrection is supposed to be um, celebrated or it's supposed to be lived, God wants you and I to be able to live the resurrection, not so much as celebrate. Resurrect means to be able to bring back, reestablish, come back from something. And a lot of times what we're doing is celebrating it and not actually um, demonstrating it. God wants you and I to be a type of resurrection, something that we come back from when he, when he dealt with Lazarus, brought back Lazarus and God wants to bring back his people. He says in Ephesians, you have equipment who were dead in trespasses and in sins. God wants to bring you back and reestablish you back from the relationship that was ruined to Adam and Eve in the garden. Remember, God said, they take up the tree of knowledge of good and evil that we surely die. They died in the garden of, of, um, they died in the garden of um, Eden when they took up the tree of knowledge and good and evil. Now, God has used Jesus Christ, his son, to be able to reestablish us through the resurrection. That's why Jesus says, I'm the resurrection, but I want to get into that teaching. God was showing me that um, a reason why with the corona and a lot of things, he allowed the church doors to be shut, even though I remember Trump saying about three or four weeks ago that, he, that the church doors were going to be open, that we could all be able to celebrate Easter. And God began to teach me right there because we're celebrating Easter. Meaning that you and I are celebrating the Easter bunny. We're not celebrating the lamb, the lamb of God. Jam, John, John said, uh, behold the lamb of God, which take away the sins of the world. Understand people are celebrating the Easter bunny. They're not celebrating the lamb, lamb of God, which is Jesus Christ. So they're celebrating the bunny. And then I went into this morning, uh, if you keep your finger in the book of John, I went into Romans chapter one, for those who are familiar with that. And I went in verse three, uh, or 23 of Romans chapter one. And it says, and change... And I'm sorry, in verse 22 of Romans chapter 1, professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the God and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. What is that? That's an Easter bunny. That's it's, it's so amazing that we have given up the lamb and have chose to worship an Easter bunny. And then we uh, look down on the people, the children of Israel, when they were in the wilderness waiting for Moses to come back with the commandments from God. And they had a golden calf at the bottom. God says that we're no different. And he talked to them about this in Romans. 
He says they created birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. And these are things that they have chose to worship outside of worshiping the Lamb of, Lamb of God, which is the Christ. They have made it Easter about an Easter bunny. They have made Christmas about a Santa Claus has nothing to do with birth of Jesus, has everything to do with their traditions. The tradition of man is actually keeping people from actually being saved. And people are um, saying this is nothing wrong with having these traditions. And God's saying it's these very traditions that are causing the problems and why people are not being saved in the ministry because of tradition. Tradition is something that we're doing once a year, but tradition doesn't mean that you have a relationship. It's just something that you do. It said that Christmas and Easter have the highest attendance rate all year long is Christmas and Easter because these are the times that people tend to go to church because it's the most popular day. So what happens if God allows the churches to be able to close and you can't have Easter? That means you can't have tradition, but you can still have Resurrection Sunday. Pastors are trying to get to their churches because they feel like they have to be inside of their building to celebrate a um, Resurrection Sunday and God said that is not so. That is religion. That's not his relationship. That is a pattern. That is tradition. That is something that you're used to doing. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have relationship. There are religious and people out here that pray three times a day but have the same heart. Um, practice of tradition doesn't mean that you're changed. You can do something over and over again, but it doesn't mean that you have a heart. Jesus says they confess me with their mouth, but their hearts are far from me. Verse 24, God says, therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie. Exchanged the truth of God for the lie. What is he teaching right there? What truth have we exchanged? Well, we exchanged the resurrection of Christ for the story of the Easter bunny. That's a change of truth. We exchanged the birth of Jesus, the immaculate conception for a Santa Claus and reindeers and Frosty the Snowman's and all those things. We exchanged the truth for the lie because we wanted to have a tradition. It's a tradition that we put up a tree. It's a tradition that we put up lights. It's a tradition that we drink eggnogs. It's a tradition that we eat black beans. It's a tradition that we go to church on this day. And it's a tradition that we have dinner. But if I take away your traditions, what do you have? What do you have now? If you can't have church and you can't go to a physical building and you can't dye eggs and you can't do an Easter egg hunt, what type of traditions that you have? This is a nation that says, in God we trust. But I don't think there has ever been a cross outside of the White House. I don't think there has ever been anything that has a re any representation of Jesus outside the White House. But there is always an Easter egg hunt that takes place and is televised outside of the White House. And Easter represents the God of Asterisk, the fertility God. And that's what it's all about. That's why it's all about its eggs. But there's probably have never been a cross or anything, a crucifix, anything outside of the White House. It has always been the promotion of the Easter Bunny. And now they can't have Easter. God says, I don't want them to have Easter. I want them to be able to celebrate the resurrection if they're going to celebrate it. But what I'm going to teach you that this resurrection, the resurrection was not meant to just be celebrated. It was supposed to be demonstrated. It was supposed to be preached. It was supposed to be a lifestyle. It wasn't supposed to be something that you do on a specific day. I made a point this morning. Every year, you don't even know when Easter is going to be. The man has to tell you when Easter is going to be. How can a man tell you when to celebrate your God? Get blessed by what I'm saying. Every year, they tell you what day Easter is going to be on, but they keep the date which Christmas is going to be on, but they tell you when to have Easter, but you always know Christmas is going to fall on the 25th. They tell you when it's going to be President's Day. They tell you when to celebrate Martin Luther King's Day when it's not even his birthday. They just put it on the holiday so that you can have a three-day weekend. You never really celebrate his birthday on his birthday. You celebrate it when they tell you to celebrate it at the end of your three-day weekend. Get blessed by what I'm saying. And the day that you're honoring him is not even the day of his birthday. It's the day which creates a three-day weekend for people who don't even care nothing about Martin Luther King or know what he stand for or know what he preached. But they put it right at the end so you can have a three-day weekend like they do with President's Day, Veterans Day, and any other day. And now what they have done with your resurrection day is place it on a day where they feel fit to put it. But it's not your choice. It's not my choice. How can a man decide when you celebrate the resurrection? How can man decide? Because it's not about the resurrection. It's about Easter. It's big business. Pastors, preachers know that this is the biggest time of the year where you make the most money outside of Christmas. Resurrection Sunday is big business. That's why they wanted the country, the country back open around that time because it is definitely big business. People are losing all type of money. That's why pastors are saying, I would rather still have service because I would rather have service and get money knowing I can be bailed out, but at least we still have the collection plate. You must understand great teaching. What does it matter if I go to jail and get a fine for $5,000 when I've collected twenty-five dollars to $30,000? People wake up, it's a mystery. 
misdemeanor. It's a slap on the wrist. They're not telling you you're going to get a felony charge. You're going to be in jail forever. So why wouldn't a pastor be afraid of going to jail when it's a misdemeanor? You can probably can get out on your own recognizance for something like that. So don't 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 think, hey, these pastors are really standing up. They're not standing up for life sentence. They're not standing up to be able to die. But there's going to come a time, God showed me, where those who, who um, profess him are going to be forced with death that no pastor's not being forced with death right now. So if you have church right now, you may go to jail, you pay a hefty fine, but what's a hefty fine when you already have so much in the collection plate? Don't be tricked and say, oh, these pastors are really going hard for Christ because they're still going to have church. It's a, it's a measly fine. And it's maybe a day in jail if that, and you're going to be there, you're going to get out of that. They're not going to keep you for that. Trust me, I definitely know this. I know law. You're not, they're not going to keep you that long. You're going to be out of jail, but guess what? You have your collection because it's tradition. Anybody that's forcing you to go to church right now don't have a relationship with God. They basically have tradition. And this is why people feel uncomfortable that they can't get to church because they don't have a relationship. They have a tradition. What are we going to do? We can't go to church. We can't have Sunday dinner. They say more than 10 people can't be gathered. Let me teach you a great teaching. The day you should be worried is when they say more than three people cannot gather because that is the time of the Antichrist. As long as it's 10, the number is good. They're saying 10. They're not saying three. Whenever they tell you that three or more can't gather, then there's a problem because that means that the Antichrist is in the house because the two or more are gathered. He is in the midst. So understand, never be worried about the 10. Always worry when it's three or less because then that means that it's an error in the law. But then we're still supposed to worship. We're still supposed to pray. I bet you. You know, I, I seen something the other day that was such a great teaching that a pastor was talking about Daniel. And he was saying that Daniel still worshiped and prayed, right? So he felt the need to still have service because Daniel was told not to pray and he still did it. The, 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 the laws are not telling you not to play, pray. They didn't tell you not to have church. They told you not to gather and tend. You must understand great teaching. But look how people take the scripture and twist it for their, for their own benefit. Oh, Daniel wouldn't have had prayer. That didn't mean Daniel wouldn't have had service. Daniel still had prayer when they told him not to pray. And yes, prayer at that time was against the law of the land. But if the law of land um, uh, um, comes and comes and, uh, mixed with the law of God, then you definitely must obey the law of God. But they did not say you could not have church. They said you could not gather. The Bible says that we are the church. The church is a representation of the group of believers. But there's pastors out here quoting Daniel as if to say, I'm going to still have church because that was in the time of Daniel. They never told Daniel they couldn't have church. They told him he couldn't pray to any other God and he still kept praying. That's not what the law is saying. The law is saying that you can still have church. Uh, I listened to the governor of Virginia the other day. He says we have to find a way to be able to still fellowship and still have our relationship with God outside of gathering, knowing that the gathering of us could cause some to be sick. Understand, that's just such great teaching right there. But go back to uh, Romans chapter 1. Who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the, create, the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. What creature are we serving rather than the creator? The creature is who? The creature is the Easter bunny. The creature is the Saint Nick, the Santa Claus, the man. We serve all these creatures. We have angels. We have statues. We pray to statues. We pray to Virgin Marys. We pray to St. Peter's. We pray to crosses and all those things. And God says they're celebrating the creature versus what? The creator. Why are you serving the creature? Why are you serving the gift more than you serve the gift giver? God says that is tradition. Tradition is something that you do. It's not have a relationship because the Bible says, show me your faith by your works. And, and basically what he's saying, if I remove your church, let me see your church. If I shut the doors of your church, what will your church do? Will, you, will your church get upset and do nothing? Or will your church continue to go live and continue to spread the gospel? God is saying, if I shut the doors of your church, I'm going to see if you still have a relationship with me outside of the building. It makes so many of us uncomfortable because we don't know how to have a relationship with him without going to church. Because we don't even, some of us don't even know, and I'm not putting anybody down. How to open our Bible and find the scripture, where to read, where to go. And you know what? That's not even your fault. It comes from bad teaching that nobody has taught you how to be in relationship with him. They have taught you how to have service, but they haven't taught you how to have a relationship. If you keep going to service, you'll always be dependent upon your church, dependent upon your pastor, needing somebody to guide you through the Bible. But if you have a relationship, you know how to get in your own daily bread and get into your own Psalms and get into your own readings. And that's why some people who have been hurt by the church say, I don't need church because they have 
found a way to maybe have a relationship with him outside the church. But that's not even correct because the Bible says to not to forsake the assembling of yourselves, meaning that I don't like you having church by yourself. God says you're not as strong by yourself. I will leave the 99 and come after the one. So anyone who thinks they can have church by themselves, God says you're wrong because if you're supposed to be a part of the body of Christ, how is it that the arm is without the leg and the head is without the feet? How are you a part of a body of Christ and you're talking about you're going to have church at home and not be amongst the believers? The Bible says that's a trick of the enemy to get you by yourself because a twofold cord is not easily broken. Meaning that the devil wants you to think you can have church by yourself and not be with the believers because we're stronger together, but we're weak when we're divided. That's why he says in the scripture that a house divided cannot stand. We've been, been divided by uh, Pentecostal Baptists, Episcopalians, Catholics, um, Seventh Day of Venice, um, uh, Jehovah Witness. We, but Christ is not divided. But we have allowed ourselves to be what? Divided all through our traditions. There's things that Jehovah Witnesses do right now that Christians don't do, that Catholics do, that the people in Pentecostal do. We're all doing something different, all have a different tradition. But we, none of us have a great relationship because we have not shown that we can respond. We're forcing our way into churches. You know why? Because pastor don't know how to have church outside of his building. They never, I've seen people doing drive through churches. Still, they still getting there because I, I don't know what to do. I got to have church. I got to be in front of the people. It's, you know, the thing about it is God showed me one time before. He says, Q, sometimes you have to watch the calling because make sure it doesn't become all about you. He says, sometime in ministry, pastors get so used to being filled up, be, uh, being applauded, being clapped for, and tell how awesome they are that when it's time to do the work of the Lord, they can't do it without an audience. That's why God has always showed me how to do the ministry without an audience, not having a lot of people because he said there's going to come a time where you're going to have to preach for one person and then you might have to have to preach for no people. But some people can't preach unless they have an audience and being on live and being in front of people isn't a drill in a rush. It's an addiction. It's something that's feeding you. That's why you need to do it. It's not that you need to have church. You have your own drug and your own drug has become people lifting you up and building you up and praising you. You have become your own God and you need people to feel that. And God says, that's why I'm shutting it. Notice these pastors, there's rushing, trying to get back to the church. He did. Listen, you know what God did in the book of Acts? Every time they ran them the, the Christians away, they went somewhere else and had church, not in their own buildings. Matter of fact, Jesus very seldomly had church in church. Every, last time he was in the church, he turned over the temple. He turned over the tables and said, my house should be called a house of prayer, not a den of thieves. These, Jesus didn't even like what was going on in the church. He very seldomly preached in the church. He took them out to the Mount of Olives and he preached to them there outside, outside of the ministry because Jesus knew that the ministry would be more effective if it was outside than inside. He said when it's inside, it's closed off. Everybody can't hear it. I'd rather for the ministry to be outside where people can hear it. That's why when he taught, he taught outside, not inside, but we're rushing to get inside. Reason why? Because there's more money we can collect when you're inside than outside. If you're outside, you can't control if the people give or how they walk away when you're outside, but inside you can control the narrative. You can control the crowd on the inside, but outside you can't control who walk up in here and walk away. I love great teaching because one time I was downtown and a man was playing a guitar or playing some type of instrument. And right in front of his instrument, he had his guitar suitcase open and people were walking by. And some people enjoyed the sounds and some people that enjoyed the sound gave and threw into his guitar. Some people enjoyed the sound and walked away. God showed me, he says, Q, that's how I would love for my ministry to be where people could just walk up and hear it. The problem with the church, they wouldn't like a ministry like that because there's no ushers there to be able to dictate who can give and the people can be able to walk out. Let me teach you great teaching, man. God showed me the one day about the integrity of people. He says, listen, if, if if you allow people to get a free word, they will give a free word. They will hear the word and walk away just like somebody's outside playing an instrument and somebody have the choice to be able to give him money. He's not asking for money. He's playing for free. If they choose to give, they give. But God says, listen, the people won't give the, the, the people won't give if they have an outlet. They only feel forced to give because it's set up like that. They have the ushers. They have the roles, the releasing of the roles for certain people to give. He says, but if you never did a releasing of the roles, if you never passed the basket, he says, some people will walk out and not even give. He says, some people will give without you asking. He said, then there's some people that have to be forced to give. Churches have forced you to give by calling your row. And, and, and if you never mentioned tithes and offerings, somebody probably would never mention that at all. Man, you got to understand great teaching. 
Are you one of them people, man? I tip my waiter before he even acts because I appreciate the service. Listen, when I said I, pre I, t I tip my wa waiter before he even acts because I appreciate the service. I sat down before I ate already intended from the heart to be able to tip whether the service was good or bad because I understand the service. But that's because it's a heart thing. That's why when people go out, they don't like to go out in great parties because it's always a problem with the bill after you have been served. Get blessed. God says that's why a lot of you don't like to go out with large parties because right at the end of the large party, everybody wants to become a mathematician and figure out the bill and that they have to understand that not only am I paying for the service, but I have to pay for the tips. You got to understand through this thing where God says, I am the waiter. You got to do your tithes and your offer. It's not just about you paying me for the bill. You got to put something on top of that when you understand that he said he that wants to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven must first be a servant you must understand the greatest waiter that had ever waited had to be the lord jesus christ because he was the greatest serve he said i did not come to be worshiped he says i came to serve how did you you didn't know that your god was a server he said i didn't came to be worshiped he said i came to be able to what serve he said the greatest in the kingdom of heaven is a servant a person who knows how to be able to serve he's teaching right there but go back to John chapter 11, I want to talk about the resurrection. So he's teaching, he says, Q, the resurrection is not supposed to be celebrated. It's supposed to be demonstrated. God says, I don't want many people celebrating the resurrection. I want them to demonstrate the resurrection. To demonstrate the resurrection, meaning that I must first um, have the relationship with him and allow him to resurrect. Resurrect means to maybe to bring me back. What is he bringing me back from? He's bringing me back from the fact that Adam and Eve took of a tree of knowledge and good and evil. And the Bible said that they take of the tree, they will surely die. Since they were my ancestors, they passed that down to me, which was the curse. And now I'm dead to God, meaning that I'm dead spiritually. So I need to be resurrected, need to be able to be brought back, right? So since I need to be able to brought back, I need a savior to be able to uh, bring us back. The Bible says in uh, I believe it's Second Corinthians that God was inside of Jesus reconciling the world to himself for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Um, God has um, there's only one mediator between man and God, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says you can't get to the father unless you first have the son. So. I want to talk about the resurrection and one of the most popular revelations, uh, resurrections in the Bible that most preachers are preaching this morning is the book of John chapter 11, talking about the fact that Lazarus was brought back from the dead. I want to talk about first the conversation that Jesus had with um, Lazarus sisters, Mary and Martha, who he was dear friends with. And Jesus had a conversation with um, Martha in the book of John chapter 11 after Lazarus had already died. But I want to teach you something real quick. The Bible says that Lazarus died, but Jesus said that Lazarus was only asleep. What did that mean? But everybody said he was dead, but Jesus said he's asleep. There's two different teachings taking place. Jesus said he's asleep, but the people say he's dead. You must understand things that people call dead, God's only saying is sleep, right? Because God says you call it one thing, I call it another. Some people say you washed up. Some say people say things is over. God it says I'm just beginning the work. So what God was teaching that man sees things different than what I see. Man looks at the outward appearance. Come on, get blessed. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Man says, your condition is over. Man said, it's over for you. God says, he's only sleeping. I just have to go and awake him. I believe that Jesus allowed Lazarus to die because he didn't want to heal him from being sick because he had already been known as a healer. He wanted to be known as a one who could res resurrect, mean to be able to bring back from the dead because people wasn't bringing people back from the dead. So Jesus said that Lazarus was sleeping. If you know the story as well, the, the young girl, Tabitha, Jerry's daughter, she also had died. And when Jesus was on the way to jury his house after dealing with the woman who had the issue of blood for 12 years the people say listen don't trouble the master no more because you were waiting for jesus to get here and in, and in between time him dealing with that woman your daughter died no need to trouble the master any longer jesus said listen don't listen to what they say jerry i only need you to believe when jesus got there he said she's only asleep but they laughed him to scorn because they said she was dead jesus did something of great maturity which people didn't understand they said the people who laughed he put them out the room meaning that they didn't have the level to believe to go into 
to the next room. So he had to deal with the unbelievers in one room. He said, those who are laughing can't go to the next place. So he didn't permit them to come when he was going to do the resurrection because they were laughing. That, that, that taught something right there. Everybody can't go with you to the place where God is calling you because some people was laughing at what you say that God is going to do. Believe it or not, you tell people some things that God is going to do and they laugh about it and they make you feel ashamed about it. But I should not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ for us, the power of God into salvation to the Jew first, to the Gentile second. I should not be ashamed of him for me, but he may be ashamed of me before his father. Jesus goes into the room and Tabitha, he said, my daughter, he called her name. He said, Talith Kami. And she awoke up and she arose. He woke her out of her sleep. He did the same thing. He said, Lazarus is not, is not sleeping, not dead. Lazarus is sleeping, but you think he's dead. I went this morning. I taught this from a par from the place of Genesis chapter three. Remember, the Bible says that Adam was alive. Adam was moving around. The Bible says that God had to put Adam into a deep sleep that he can remove a rib out of him. People don't know that the sleep that God was talking about to Adam, meaning that Adam had to be dead. Dead means that he had to be in a place of unconsciousness. Right. That's what it means. Adam got put to sleep as a form of death. And while he was deaf under what we consider anesthesia in our terms, God went in and removed a rib from out of Adam. When he removed that rib from out of Adam, he went and brought him a woman and then he woke him back up. He brought the woman to him. He says, what do you see? He says, I see flesh in my flesh, in my flesh bone in my bone, right? But he had to be put to sleep first, had to be put to death. So what God was teaching right there, even in Genesis, that before you can even birth anything, you must first be put to death. That's why he says you and I must be born again. He was teaching that. That was even before the sin even came. So now, since you understand the difference between one being asleep and one being dead, I want to take you to another teaching in Thessalonians. Thessalonians says that when the day of the Lord comes, you should be the, it should be a shout of the uh, arch angle, the shout of the trumpet. And he said the dead in Christ shall rise. When he's talking about the dead in Christ, he's talking about those who are asleep. Well, what do you mean sleep? Well, when people die, you say rest in peace. Because the, 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 uh, the Bible teaches that um, when we die, we go into internal rest. That's why Jesus, here's great teaching, right? Jesus told the thief on the cross when, when he was beside him, he said, today you will be with me in paradise, not in heaven. A lot of people always say when you die, you go to heaven. But why did Jesus say today you will be with me in paradise? At this particular time, Jesus had already, Jesus, I don't even think had told, yeah, at this particular time, Jesus had told disciples a few chapters before that in John chapter 14, um, he says, listen, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. He hadn't yet departed yet. So that place had not been uh, fully developed yet. It was almost like a house under construction. He says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it was not so, I would not have told you so. Meaning, but he says, I have to go and prepare a place for you because heaven was created for God and his angels. It was never created for human beings. So Jesus says, listen, I have to go and prepare a place for you there where I am. Because he is God, you may be also, because I created heaven for me and the angels. It wasn't created for you. So I now have to go prepare a place for you. But while I'm preparing a place, there is a place for you on earth called paradise. And everybody knows the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Lazarus and the rich man, one went to paradise, which was called Abraham's bosom. And one of them went to Hades, which was a representation of hell. And the Bible says that there was a great gulf between the two. So Jesus told the thief on the cross, today you shall be with me in paradise. Why your soul is in paradise which Catholics believe to be purg purgatory, which is basically Abraham's bosom, the place where you go, but your body is at rest. Your flesh is at rest, right? Your flesh is at rest, but he said there are people in paradise. But he says this of great teaching. That's why I told somebody the other day, I said, you ever notice that when you have dreams, I'm not sure how many of you guys dream, but have you ever dreamed and seen the dead? Because people believe when we when we dream, we tap into um, the, the spiritual realm. And that's why you see your grandmother, you see your father, you see your cousin. How many of you have been dreaming and you've seen dead people? You say, how am I seeing dead people? How are they still here? Because when you dream, you tap into the spiritual realm. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spirits and principalities and high places. There is another realm that's going on around you and outside of you, a great demonstration of teaching. Have you ever seen the movie Ghost that Patrick Swayze was still stuck here in the way? That was such a great teacher. Whoever did that had a little bit of understanding of the Bible, though he was not there anymore. He was still there walking around. The, the, the Bible says there's a spiritual realm that's going on around us, a place of paradise, but that's another great teaching. I don't want to get into that. So what, what, what Jesus was teaching, he says, listen, 
anybody who go, anybody who dies is really asleep and they're waiting for me to, they're waiting for me to be able to awaken them. So when he's having this dialect with Martha, Martha understands the resurrections because the Sadducees, religious people, they don't believe in the resurrection, which is basically called the rapture. But the Pharisees do, they do believe in the resurrection, which is the rapture. So Jesus having this conversation with Martha in the book of John chapter 11, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you have been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask for, God will give it to you. She's on the same page. She said, listen, I still believe, but you know, I believe that you've been here. He wouldn't have died. And um, Jesus said to her, do you, he says, where were you? He says, he said to her in verse 23, he says, Martha, your brother will rise again. She says, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Talking about the rapture. She's not understanding. Jesus is telling her that he is the rapture. I mean, he is the resurrection. He has the ability to be able to bring one back. Martha is talking about the rapture because the, the way the Torah and the Old Testament, which she have known is, to be, is taught, is that God will come back and he will, re he will resurrect everyone. That is what she's standing on. That's of her knowledge. But she doesn't know that she's standing in front of one who is able to bring you back from the dead when you actually physical, physically die. Though Jesus brought Lazarus back from the physical death, he was teaching from a spiritual aspect. Remember, I've taught word movers that everything God did in the Old Testament, he did in the new, in the spiritual. So right now he's doing a physical thing, but he's talking about a spiritual thing. He says, yes, I can bring you back from the dead, right? But I, I, I remember one time when I first was, um, as a, as a pastor, I always had this question for God, and this is probably a little uh, arrogance of me. I always wanted to go to a funeral as a pastor, right? Believe it or not. And I wanted to lay hands on the body. And I wanted the body to be able to resurrect. But I know, and God says, that will cue, if you know if you did that, that would probably be one of the most scariest things to the whole family and everything. But I always wanted to do that. I always wanted to be able to lay hands on the dead and have the dead get up out of the casket. I always thought that would be great. And I thought people would come to God that way. God says, Q, that would scare people. That wouldn't even believe, people wouldn't even believe. He says, let me teach you something. Do you know that? You doing that is not going to help the person. He says, Q, if you go to the grave right now to somebody's funeral and you lay hands on the casket and the person gets up, he said, does that produce salvation or not? And I thought about it. I said, wow, God, that does not produce salvation. He says, so why would you want to bring somebody back from the dead when you don't have the, when it doesn't produce salvation or bring me any type of glory? He said, if you go to a funeral, and raise somebody from the dead. He said, you would have more followers than me. And right then and there, I understand. And God checked me and dealt with me on that. He says, if you raise somebody from the dead, you would have more followers than me. People would follow you. So therefore, I can't allow you to bring anybody back from the dead because people will follow you. And since you're a man and, and you fail, right? He said, since you're a man and you fail, if people follow you the day that you fall, they will stop following me because they have followed you. And then now they will not follow nobody because they have followed when a man who raised somebody from the dead. And when that man fall, they will never follow me again. I said, wow, God, I understand. And he says, matter of fact, the resurrection that I was talking about is not to bring somebody back from the physical dead, but bring them back from spiritual death. He says, spiritual death is what I want to bring people back from. I want to restore that relationship. He said, bringing people back from the dead doesn't mean that they're going to be with me because if somebody died not knowing me and you bring them back from the dead, it doesn't mean that they now know me that you have brought them back. He says, I'm talking about spiritual resurrection to be able to bring a person back from the place where Adam and Eve caused them to be of not knowing me and having a relationship with me, a reconciliation, not bringing a person back from the physical dead. So then I said, God, to understand because I didn't understand why did you bring back Lazarus from the dead? Why did you do that? He says, I brought back Lazarus from the dead to show that I can bring a person back from spiritual death. You're looking at the physical. He said, it has nothing to do with the physical. It has everything to do with the spiritual. He says, listen what I tell Martha. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, shall he live. He said, that is for a living person. That is not for a dead person. He says, he who believes in me. For if you confess with your mouth and you believe with your heart, the Lord Jesus have raised him from the dead. What he said, John 10, 9, John 10 and 9, then you shall be saved with the confession, with the confession, the um, statement is made with the heart. One believeth. He says, all everybody's looking at the resurrection as actually dying and coming back. He said, Ephesians 2, 1 says, you have quickened 
who was dead in trespasses and in sins. Do you know a person that doesn't have Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is considered to be a dead man walking because they have not been what? Born again. Jesus told um, Nicodemus, I said this morning, Nebuchadnezzar, that was wrong. Jesus told Nicodemus, he said, Nicodemus, unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Born again means to what? Um, receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and I die in the flesh. He who comes after me must first deny himself, take up his cross, and follow after me. This says, Jesus says, you must die first. Jesus says, unless a grain of wheat falls into a ground and dies into itself, it cannot what? Bring forth fruit. So you must die. A grain of weed, when it hits the ground, is buried, it dies. And then when it dies, it's able to be able to bring forth fruit. Jesus actually was talking about himself. He said, in order for me to be able to bring forth fruit, I must first die first. And when I die, you're going to be able to see the fruit. And the fruit is all you guys. So he's teaching. But Martha doesn't yet get it. She's still thinking about the resurrection of the dead. She's thinking about the rapture. Jesus says, I am the resurrection. So much great teaching there because... Jesus says, I am the resurrection. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. When Moses is at the mountain talking to God, he says, I am that I am. Why, what is up with this I am? And, one, and before I teach you on that, um, Jesus, right before he was taken to the cross, was in the garden. And um, they came to get him. And they said, where is Jesus? And he says, I am. And the Bible says that they all fell back because there was so much power in I am. Jesus was teaching right there that, you know what? I'm not self-surrender. I'm not being taken by my, against my own will. I'm self-surrendering. This is what Jesus wanted people to know. He told the disciples, he says, Peter, when Peter cut off Malchus, he says, Peter, don't you know to have the power to be able to call to God who would give me 12 leaders of angels? And then when I say I am, them same people fall back. What, what makes you think that I'm being taken? This is all self-surrender. This is all part of the will. Father, not this, let this cup pass from me, but not my will. Let your will be done. What Jesus is teaching this, he says, listen, I didn't go to the cross outside of my will. I self-surrendered to the cross. Jesus had the same power that Samson had when Samson was uh, against the two pillars. Samson brought the whole house down because he still had his power at his death. Jesus was teaching right there. He said, if Samson had his power at his death, what makes you think I didn't have mine? I demonstrated my power before I went to the cross. He says, I could have called 12 leaders of angels. He said, I had the power to say I am, and they all fell back. He said, what makes you think I couldn't come down off the cross? The man sat down at the bottom of a cross and said, you know what? He saved others. Why can't he save himself? But Jesus was teaching right there too. He says, I'm not going to fall into that because I'm not up here for me. I'm up here for you. If I come down, then you can't be saved. So I'm up here for you. He said, the nails are not keeping me up here because I have enough power to get down off of the cross. This is what he's teaching. Jesus was not nailed to the cross, though they tell you and show you the nails. He was nailed to the cross. What I'm trying to teach here is the nails didn't have enough power to keep him there. The Bible says love kept him there. And the thing is that the cross didn't kill him, meaning that it didn't suffocate him. He said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit before he let the cross kill him. The Bible says he gave up the ghost. You know, the thing about it is, is that I've seen some in the emergency room. And sometimes when we have people on life support, we're waiting for them to die. What if you could just be lying there and say, okay, father, I'm ready to go. And he comes and he come and take you. A lot of times that's not how it works. At least that's not how we know it. Jesus says, okay, I'm ready to go now. I've done this. I've already died on the cross. And then after he died on the cross, he was three days in the heart of the earth. He says, as, as Daniel was in the heart of the, I'm sorry, as Jonah was in the heart of the fish for three days, so must the son of man be in the heart of the earth for three days. He didn't just die. He went and had another assignment to be able to take the keys away from the devil. Then he went to go. The Bible says he went and set the cap captives free. And there was 500 people were seen walking on the earth after he set the captives free. So he didn't just die. He transformed at transformation as a caterpillar goes from a butterfly. And then he had another assignment in the spirit. He had another assignment. And then after being there three days, after being that assignment, he came back to the body that which he um, left on the cross. And that now that body was inside of the tomb because he's getting ready to demonstrate the resurrection. So with, with me saying all that, what am I trying to say? He's telling Martha that I have the power to be able to bring Lazarus back 
from the dead, just like I have the power to be able to reconcile and bring an individual back into the relationship. So he goes to the tomb, and I'm going to teach it this way. He goes to the tomb, and he sees Lazarus there. She says, listen, Lazarus have been laying here for four days. Now, the thing about it is that when Jesus and Lazarus, I've, I've taught this parallel before, because Jesus and Lazarus was both in the tomb, but, but two things happened differently. Jesus go to the tomb, and Lazarus had been for four days, and he calls him by his name. He say, Lazarus, come forth. Right. And when Lazarus comes forth, Jesus tells the people, he says, listen, I need you to uh, remove his grave clothes. And he said, loose him and let him go. Meaning that they buried Lazarus like a mummy, had him all wrapped up. Right. And since they had him all wrapped up, though Lazarus lift up, he could not move. He can't move his arms. He can't move his leg because he's still bound in grave clothes. If somebody wrapped you like a mummy, you just be able to lift up or sometimes you can't even move because you have on grave clothes. So Jesus, Jesus in his situation, when they came to the tomb, Jesus didn't have any clothes on. He left his clothes folded. I'm going to teach that in a second. The Bible says that how do you bind, how, how can, how can, he says you must first bind the strong man. How do you bind a strong man? He says you must first get into the strong man's house and you must be able to bind him. Then you're able to plunder all his goods. Jesus knew he had the power to raise Lazarus, but though he had the power to raise Lazarus, Lazarus still had on grave clothes, meaning that he could not move. So he told the people to be able to lose him. What he's teaching is this. You can be resurrected. You can be brought back. But sometimes you can be resurrected and you still have on all of these grave clothes, meaning that grave clothes represent what somebody else put you in. It represents an identity that somebody has gave you and you're wrapped up all in that. Just like Delilah had Samson bound where every time she bound him, the first couple of times he was able to get out. But once he really told her where his great strength lieth, she had him wrapped up and bound that he couldn't even shake it anymore. So the enemy knows that if you're bound, right, even though you're resurrected, you can't move. So somebody have to loose you. That's what it, the teachings of, excuse me, woman, you are loose. It represents soul ties, the thing that you have been tied up in. Sometimes that when we get resurrected, we're still tied up in things in our lives that are allowing us to not be able to function in kingdom. So listen, they, they loose Lazarus, right? But then Jesus is different. When they go to the tomb, Jesus' body is not there, right? But the tomb is removed. Right. I mean, the, the, the stone has been removed. His body is not there. But the Bible says in the book of John, I think around the 20, the 20th verse. And um, so they ran. So they both ran together and other disciples outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he stooping down, looking and saw the linen clothes lying there. Yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following, and went in the tomb and he saw the linen clothes lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen clothes but folded together in a place by itself. This, this is such great teaching. I taught it this morning. If you ever go into somebody's house and their house has been burglarized or maybe they were in a rush, you can see clothes and everything all over the place. And it gives you the impression that something was wrong because even they was in a panic or they felt the need to be able to get out or to be able to get away. You say, you know what? Clothes are all over the place. Notice Jesus had, was very particular how he left the tomb. He didn't leave the tomb any old type of way. He decided to leave the tomb with the clothes folded up neatly together, letting the disciples know, listen, if somebody had stole my body, they sure wouldn't take the time to fold my clothes. I want you to know that I came and I resurrected because I took the time to fold the clothes. The clothes that you gave me, I didn't need them. I left them here for you, folded up nice and neatly because that what you buried me in is that is not what I'm going to need. I had the power to be able to come out of the grave clothes. You didn't have to loose me because when God raised me, he raised me with power, power to be able to come out of soul ties, power to be able to come out of the identity of the things that they have me buried in. He says, so therefore I no longer need the clothes because there is a resurrection. So what Jesus was saying is that, listen, when a lot of us get brought back, we have on the same grave clothes and we spend our whole time fighting against the identity of though we're wearing the same clothes that we have been resurrected. Right. But the, but the enemy found out that if I can put on resurrected clothes and not have to actually um, live the resurrection, but celebrate it. And that's why they say wolves in sheep's clothing. The tradition says Easter clothes, Easter hats, Easter dresses, Easter suits. Those are resurrection, resurrected clothes. 
but that doesn't mean that the person has a resurrected life. We have been taught to celebrate it, not demonstrate it. So since we celebrate it, we have resurrected clothes, not a resurrected life. Those who worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. God says you can't just have resurrected clothes on. You must have a resurrected life because everybody can look resurrected by the clothes they have on. That's why Jesus left the clothes. He says, I don't need, I don't need these clothes anymore because I'm going to show you how to be clothed in what righteousness put ye on Christ. Matter of fact, when Jesus showed up, he showed up in his glorified body. That's why he told him, you, I can't, you can't touch me at this time because I'm not, I'm, I'm in my glorified body. So my purpose of teaching today is I want the individuals to know to get out of tradition. God is allowing these churches and things to be shut down because we're celebrating Easter. We're not celebrating the resurrection. And God says, matter of fact, get away from the celebration of the resurrection. I want you to live the resurrection. I want you to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And I want to have reconciliation. I want to be able to restore to you the relationship that was broken in the Garden of Eden by you receiving me as Lord and Savior. If you're celebrating the resurrection, it's not going to do you no good if you have not been resurrected. Everybody celebrates it but very few people demonstrate it. We're celebrating. He said, I want you to celebrate it. I want you to live it. And living it is not going into a church. Living it is showing fruits. You should know a tree by its fruits, not going to church. Going to church is celebrating his resurrection. I believe God is saying that, you know what? I'm allowing these churches to be shut because everybody's celebrating Easter, celebrating the resurrection with outfits. And then afterwards having dinner, but nobody is living like the Christ. They're celebrating him. They're celebrating Christmas. They're celebrating Easter with Santa Claus as an Easter bunny. He said, but nobody's actually living it. So the resurrection teaches you and I to be brought back. God is saying we're living. I'm not saying today or this year is the end times. But since we are living in the times where it is the end, God said it's time to stop playing church, stop playing tradition. God wants individuals to be able to know him for themselves and to be able to know him mean that God has to stop us from being able to have tradition. This is what God said we have to do. We have to stop them from being able to have traditions because tradition is what's killing the ministry. It's allowing people to do something and maybe and think they're okay. People go to church and think they're okay. Go to Bible study, think they're okay. But that's all he wants you to do because most people celebrate. Um, this is the biggest time of year where people celebrate the tradition of Easter, the tradition of Christmas. God says celebrating is not what I'm asking for. I'm looking for a relationship. Father, we just thank you right now. We thank you for this word. We thank you for this time. We thank you for blessing us and keeping us in perfect peace. Thank you for blessing us, oh, Father God, that we don't have religion, that we have relationship. Thank you for keeping us in all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Love you guys. I'm the voice, Pastor Q.